I love what God does right here. I tell you, I am thoroughly, enthusiastically, and unequivocally in love with you. I'm serious. You are an amazing church, and I love being with God's people. And uh, I'm telling you, church is better when you're here. We're going to have good church even if you're not here. But it's better when you're here. Why? Because you allow the Holy Spirit to move. You allow God to do whatever God wants to do. Hey, we're Pentecostal. It's okay. We're not going to get afraid. You might be afraid. We ain't afraid. Because God's going to move, and if we get out of order, God will put us back in order. If you've never been put in check by God, (laughs) hang around. He'll do it. So I'm not worried about anything breaking out. Uh, 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 out of out of order, uh, we got enough wet blankets to put out any wildfire. So I'm not worried about that. But I don't want to miss. Come on, I don't want to miss if God is really up to something. Really up to something. I hope you aren't. Hope you aren't either. Happy Father's Day to you. And uh, you can turn to somebody next to you, tell them Happy Father's Day. This is a 20, 21st century church. Happy Father's Day to you. Miss Shirley, I don't know what kind of a a dad you had. I was blessed with an absolutely wonderful father and uh, one that I esteemed to be like. Uh, Not everybody was, and I get that. Sometimes when we talk about family, some people's families, this is for another generation, but, but some people's families look a little more like the Adams family than it did the Cleaver family. Some of y'all remember the Cleaver family. And uh, you get some really weirdness as a family sometimes. So sometimes we talk about dad, you're talking about a really bad person. You may be talking about an absentee person, somebody that was never there. I have met people who have never met their mother or their father ever. And my heart breaks. My heart breaks. And so I, I pray that if, you're, if you do have a, a, a dad and you're able to call him and tell him, Happy Father's Day, please do so. I called mine yesterday. Um, If uh, uh, you can't visit your dad for one reason or another, then I pray that you spend some time with your heavenly father today. Because I'm telling you, he is, as a song we sang, he is a good, good father. And uh, he's a whole lot better. I don't think I'm a bad dad, but I'll tell you, he's a whole lot better father than I could ever, ever be. So we do want to say thank you for being here Happy Father's Day to you. To all the dads in the house, we do have a gift for you that we want to give you uh, on your way out. And uh, as the ushers will be at the door, we've got a little something we want to put in your hand. There is an insert in your bulletin. Those of you that got a bulletin, please don't read it while I'm preaching, but do take it with you afterwards because I don't want to have to throw it away because you left it in here. But there is a, a, a little thing that I put in the bulletin. It, it came from a female psychologist and uh, uh, unfortunately, there's a lot of people have some really twisted thinking about what a dad is. This is a good article. And uh, it's, it's things, some characteristics. If you'll become a dad like that, weave those things into your fatherhood capabilities. I'm telling you, your kids are going to come out a whole lot better. Uh, especially those of you that are new dads. We got some newer dads in the house. And uh, I'm going to ask you, please pay attention to that article. Some of us, our kids are, are going or gone. Those of you that kids are, are coming in or currently there, please pay attention to this article because I promise it'll, it'll help you in your daddyhood. Parenting is not easy work. Can I get an amen on that? It is not for the weak. Good parenting is even harder. <laughs> I've seen some, man, I've seen some rascals. Uh, I was proud of my children as a dad. I had a feel-good dad moment yesterday. Uh, we, had, uh, we had bought one of these inflatable, it's like an inflatable island, great big old thing. We, about two years ago, we decided we were going to tube the Washtenaw River, and that I think it's the coldest I have ever 
water I've ever been in. And so we got this thing where we don't have to get in the water. Hallelujah. So we launched out yesterday afternoon. We got in the Washita River and we're heading down. And uh, uh, we get about halfway down and there's some commotion in the bushes. And uh, we hear this, help! Help somebody save me. Please don't shoot me. Help me somebody. Come on, man. I'm out here to relax and somebody's going to have a life-shaking moment. You know what I'm saying? And, and I see all these people going by on their tubes. Oh, you, I mean, they're down in the bushes, man. I'm serious. They got this little house on the hill. And uh, uh, they, they, I don't know if they fell down or whatever. But they're, I mean, entrenched in the bushes. And you can see it shaking around like something's going to pop out. And help, help. Nobody's helping. I don't have the luxury to leave my ordination card at home when I go to the river. I got to be a man of God wherever I go, whether I want to or not. Hello, somebody. Am I in the right house? Am I talking to godly people? So we begin to row our, our little island over there, and we're rowing, 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 and we kind of overshoot her. And uh, uh, we got caught up in some trees where we could anchor off, but she was just upstream that way, and the river was going pretty good. And uh, my boys jumped out and went swimming to her. And uh, I jumped out, and uh, I made it about halfway and stopped because I realized real quick we're going to have another problem on our hands if I keep trying to go. And uh, so my much younger, trimmer, athletic son swam upstream like good salmon and got to this woman, got her fished out of the briars and the bushes, and uh, uh, lo and behold, there was a young lady there who was, uh, well, let's just say she was cracked, okay? She, uh, she had admitted she had smoked some stuff that wasn't good. She was on some drugs. Uh, you could tell by her countenance and her teeth, she was not all there. And uh, they floated her down to the little uh, floaty thing, and, and we got her on there. She's crying and hollering and, and pitching a fit. And I had a feel-good daddy moment because my sons, without even having to be prompted, dove out of the boat to go help a life. Amen. That felt good to me. Amen. We get her back in the boat. And, and my, my wife's trying to, to help her, and my daughter kicks into mother mode. And so my daughter's right there comforting and help. Oh, she, you're just so sweet. Your sister's so sweet. Oh, she's just, oh, you're cute. She's looking at one of my sons. <laughs> and I was like, don't even look at my sons. Uh-uh, don't look at my, <laughs> look at my, look at my daughter and my wife right there. Focus right there. She didn't want me even in the boat. She said I looked like Marilyn Manson to her. <laughs> I don't know who Marilyn Manson is. Uh, that's good. Don't, because I'm telling you right now, I'm a lot better looking than Marilyn Manson. I may not look all that good, but I'm better than that. I'll tell you, but anyway, anyway, moving on. And so we, we tried to help her, and she, she eventually down the river barreled out, and we had to call 911, get Hot Springs County to come up, and she's right now, I think, a guest of Hot Springs County. But as, in the course of conversation, talking with her, come to find out she's a mother. And she said she was, she had two, she said she had two sets of twins. Four children to this one young mother eating up in drugs, horrible lifestyle. You could tell by the way she was talking, the way she was acting. And I began to think, I'm proud of my kids. Amen. I feel like I did all right as a daddy. Her, her, their mother and I could, you know, we kind of had a moment there. But I began to hurt for her children because could her children be proud of their mother? And, uh, you know, the Bible's, Bible's full of examples of good parents. Uh, Moses' parents were good parents. We're not going to kill our child. We're going to let our child live. Uh, the woman in Mark chapter 7 called out to Jesus, and here's one of these weird moments where it seems like Jesus is really putting this woman down and uh, called her a dog, and instead of getting all upset, what did the woman say? Hey, even the dogs get the scraps from the table. She's saying, Jesus, throw me a bone. I don't care. I, I just want a little something from you. I need help 
for my child. And uh, Jesus commended her enthusiastically. Jesus' own stepfather, if you would, Joseph, uh, uh, while he was not the blood father, he raised that child as his own. And I'm going to tell you that even though he was the son of God, he was also the son of Joseph. And I believe the good man that we see in Jesus had the fingerprints of his earthly father all on that. We also have examples of bad parents. Jephthah, Judges chapter 11, shoots his mouth off. He likes to make oaths and promises. Uh, He shouldn't. He says, if the Lord gives me the victory, I'll sacrifice whatever runs out the door to me. Knowing that his daughter loves him, and as soon as he comes back from winning the battle, here comes his daughter. And he has to make a sacrifice right there. And I don't believe it was a child sacrifice. I think he more or less put her in a convent or something and never saw her again. But here's a father who who was in the habit of shooting off his mouth. We have King David. King David was a good king. King David was called a man after God's own heart. Reread scripture, you'll find out David was not a good dad. There was a lot of places where David failed as a father. And then... uh, um, Uh, I remember a guy in the book of Acts chapter 20, there was a a revival service going on. Paul's preaching. Man, they're preaching till midnight. Hallelujah. Woo. I mean, you know, you have a good church if you're going to midnight. How would y'all know? Y'all ain't never been here at midnight. Man, I've been here at midnight. I'm telling you, it looks more like a haunted house than anything else. It's dark and creaky around here. Y'all ain't been here. Well, anyway, they're having some church, and Paul is preaching, and you got this one little guy by the name of Eutychus, this young man, he calls him. Eutychus is sitting in a windowsill, and uh, he falls asleep because it's midnight. He falls out of the building, squashes his head. Paul's got to go down there and raise him from the dead. Stop church and everything. Before you start shaking a finger at Eutychus, let me ask this. Where was his mama? Mmm. My wife never let my babies go to, go to sleep in church. Well, unless they're about, you know, and then they needed to go to sleep in church because, you know, they're causing a problem. But where was his mama? Where was his mama to say, hey, boy, get down from that window and come sit down in a seat? Oh, I guess y'all didn't have mamas. Come on. What would your mama do? See, we have examples. We have examples in the Bible of good parenting Bad parenting, we have all that sort of thing. And uh, thankfully, bad parents don't always produce bad kids. But how do you know good parents don't always produce good kids? That's up to a child. We take them as far as we can go, and then it's on you how you go from here. But I think it's pretty safe to assume that uh, and to know that apples don't really fall far from trees. So if you're going to make an error, err on the side of being a good parent who produces good kids. To set up today's sermon, I got to blitz through this as quick as I can. Uh, <coughs> so hang with me. All right, we're going someplace. Let, let, me, let me encourage you, don't leave until I'm done, okay? I'm trying to get through at the same time you're through. Hopefully we're through together. But if, if we're not, hang around because I don't get you tonight. We're not having service tonight, so, so I'm going to preach twice as long this morning. Maybe, maybe I need to check some people's tithe record and make sure they say, hey, you ain't preaching that long. You ain't giving enough to tell me you ain't preaching that long. Never, never, never mind. That, that, whoosh, whoosh, that came out of my mouth, Sean. Man, can you believe that? It felt so anointed coming out of my mouth. Apparently it wasn't so anointed coming in some people's ears. That's okay. I'm playing with you. I want to talk to you a little bit about some ways that God watermarks the Bible. God puts things in the Bible so we know that the Word of God is of man, uh, of God. It's not of man. Man may have dictated it, but it was, they wrote it down like a secretary, but it was the Holy Spirit who inspired the Word of God. We, you hold in your hand, if you got your Bible, how many you got your Bible right there? Mm-hmm. Turn with me to Genesis chapter 38. Turn with me in your cell phones to Genesis chapter 38. If that's, that's all the Bible you got, hallelujah, you got the Bible on, the, on your phone if you don't. Shame on you. 
you, uh, uh, we do know that this is an integrated message system. Those of you that are into to, to digital works in the media, those of you that work in the computer field can appreciate when you go through the Word of God, there are earmarks and things that are put specifically by design and, and by character in here without flaw. This is, this is a perfect Word of God. And uh, things that God puts in there, and I want to talk to you just specifically, very quickly, about some uh, intentional coding that God puts in the Word of God. Now, it's not some of this stuff that that we see Hollywood and and media put out there talking about hidden codes. Anytime you see something from this kind of a fish wrap tabloid, you just write it off and say, well, that's nothing. Well, how do you know sometimes they put stuff out? It's true, but they put it in such a way to discount it. There are things that are in the Bible that are in there by God's authenticity because he is the author of the word. And I want to get beyond some of the the silliness and the hype. But God does use things like ciphers and encryptions inside the word of God to authenticate to those who will take the time to study and find out, hey, you know what? This has to be the word of God because man couldn't have put this in there. Now, I'm going to appeal to the inner geek and some of y'all. I need you to wake your nerd up, okay? Come on, wake your nerd up. That's not the person next to you. That's you. Get your nerd on here a minute because I, I, I want to I talk to you a little bit. Throughout history, we find that, that we have used code in order to pass along secret messages. Paul Revere, as he would ride through the countryside saying, the British are coming, the British are coming. They had worked out a coding system by day or by night, whether it was by a rifle or cannon fire by day, whether it was a fire burning in the night. They had a code that if he yelled, the British are coming, it was one if by land. Oh, some of y'all paid attention in school. I didn't hear a single teenager say that, but I'm glad, I'm glad our adults did. One if by land, two if by sea. Now, the Germans had a thing in World War II called the Enigma machines. The Enigma machines, I mean, this was the craziest of the crazy because, I mean, they could send, they didn't even try to hide the fact they're telegraphing each other. But if you don't have one of these machines, you cannot crack the code. And the code always has to have a key. Anytime you send a code, there's a key that tells you how to translate that thing. And unless you capture an Enigma machine, there's no way you can get it because the code changes every day possibly even multi-times a day. And it wasn't until we actually captured one, I believe it on a submarine, they made a movie about that with Matthew McConaughey, about how they captured one of these uh, Enigma machines and were eventually able to crack the code. Now, in World War II, to be fair, America was trying to send out secret code, and everybody could decode our codes. It's like you could open up a, a box of Cracker Jacks, pull out a decoder ring, and you could decipher anything the American military was trying to do in World War II. How are we going to get our messages across? Well, they came across. Somebody had a good idea. I don't know who. You could do the scholarship. Not while I'm preaching. (laughs) Google it later. But they started talking. uh, They went and found Native Americans, specifically the Navajos. And they trained the Navajos in order to to, uh, uh, get code out across there. Man, they could talk as openly as they wanted. Because, I mean, don't nobody know Navajo, you know. I I sure don't. I can barely speak English. And so they they got these Navajo kids and young men out there and and called them code talkers. Uh, uh, Nicolas Cage put out a movie called Wind Talkers that talked all about it. We use codes. We really do. There's a couple, just to give you an example, I'm not going to labor it long, but those of you that are interested in it, you can uh, uh, just Google a thing called a cipher, uh, C-I-P-H-E-R, a cipher. You'll find out there's a whole bunch of different styles. The rail fence cipher, what you want is this right here. We are discovered, flee at once. Well, you put it in a, in a, like every fourth letter is a letter, put it on so many lines, and a rail fence meant that you read it up and down like this, regardless of whatever else is in there, and it would say, we are discovered, flee at once. This, however, is what you get from the messenger. Man, it's like speaking German or something like that. They would hand you that, you put it into your key for translation, and this is what you get. There was another one called the column translation. The message is, uh, it's plain text would be, message from Mary Stewart, kill the queen. 
This is what you're given. All this whole string of little letters, and you could break them up into five-letter sequences. Well, I'm not going to get into how y'all do it, but you have to have this key right here. The word is secret. And you know that S equals five, E equals two, something like that. And when you put it in a specific sequence that this comes out of, what you find is your message. And so you have all these ways of getting your message across. This is nothing new, man. This has been going on for, for lots of years. You have to understand God does it too. Matter of fact, Proverbs chapter 25 verse 2 tells us it is God's privilege to what? To conceal things. And it is the king's privilege to discover them. Well, that kinghood has passed on to us. And it is the privilege of a disciple to get into God's word and discover what God is trying to say. The Lord still says, I don't do anything except I first tell my people the prophets. And I'll tell you, if you're in tune with what the Holy Spirit's doing, you're going to know what he's doing. Now, in, disc in deciphering the word of God, there was a 16th century rabbi by the name of Moses uh, Cordovero who said this, the secrets of the Torah are revealed in the skipping of the letters. There's a way that you could skip the letters and figure out what the word of God was trying to say. Now, fascinating thing. Let me show you what he's talking about. When you take the Torah, the first five books of the, of the uh, Old Testament, you got to remember all languages flow towards Jerusalem. If you are uh, uh, east of Jerusalem, you read from right to left. You read what we would call backwards. If you are west of Jerusalem, you read from left to right, what we would call normal. Uh, but every, all the languages flow back that way. Well, Israel reads from right to to left. Matter of fact, what where we start over here on this side of the Bible, they actually turn to this side of the book to actually start reading the other way. That's how their language goes. Well, there's a thing called the equidistant lettering sequence. I'm not going to go very deep in this, but I need you to see it because this is what God does in Scripture. God, God will encrypt things in here, and what they found is about every 49th letter. When you skip to every 49th letter, you would find what would be the equivalent of a T. Go 49 more, you get the equivalent of an O. Go 49 more, you get the equivalent of an R. Go 49 more, you get the equivalent of an H. What does that spell? Torah. You, we can't throw the little A in there to spell out the whole word because they don't have a lot of vowels in there. Torah. And so you're reading Torah. Well, the Torah is the first five books of the Bible. Okay, well, that's coincidence. Let's go on. Well, you go to Exodus. 49 letters down, you find a T. 49 letters down, you find an O. 49 letters down, you find an R. This is throughout all of Genesis and all of Exodus. Well, you go to, uh, you go to Leviticus. It doesn't do that. It's different. It doesn't do that. Well, we move on. We go to Numbers. Numbers is different, however. It's, uh, every, when you go to the 49th letter, it's an H, and then an R, and then an O, and then a T. It's backwards. And the, and the next one, Deuteronomy does the same thing. Every 49th letter, you had T-O-R-H, now you're going H-R-O-T. Oh, well, what's the big deal about that? Well, it's fascinating that the first two books aim towards Leviticus, the last two books aim towards Leviticus. And when you go through Leviticus, every 49th letter is actually a Y, an H, a V, and an H. What we know of as the name of Yahweh, the name of God. Literally what it's pointing to is that all of the word of God goes to the book of the law. And the law is all about the Father. How have you never seen this before? I mean, this is all new to you. Look, this isn't a contrivance of man. This has been around for years. 16th century monks got this. We didn't learn about it until Hollywood started putting movies out about the Bible codes. We didn't know it was there. It's been there all along. To those who pay attention. There's another one. In uh, Genesis chapter 1, God starts talking about the trees. God said, look, I've given you every seed-bearing plant throughout the earth and all the fruit trees for your food. You go all the way down to Genesis 2, 9, God's talking about the trees. They're beautiful. They're, they're wonderful. They're good for food. If you would actually run that same sequence from Genesis 1, 29 to Genesis 2, 9, every 49th letter, uh, and, uh, and then other, they would run through other sequences, not just the 49th, but like the second, the third, the fourth. This is what you find. You find every second letter 
letter, you spell the word tamarisk. Uh, uh, terebinth, if you go backwards the other way, you got thicket, citron, acacia, almond, aloe, acacia, thornbush, olive, oak, poplar. You have all the names of the trees found in the Holy Land spaced out through different letters all throughout that short amount of Scripture. When God's talking about trees, guess what's implanted in there? The names of the trees themselves. Okay, y'all aren't as pressed about this as I was when I first saw this. I'm like, you gotta be kidding me. See, this is what God does. Man can't do that. How do you put all that in there and then start talking about, and the trees were good for food, and did it, you know, it makes sense. I remember backwards masking, you know, play it backwards, you're gonna, you're gonna get, you know, all kinds of uh, demonic messages. Uh, how do you know what you, what you get when you play country music backwards? You get your wife and your dog back. You get your wife back, your dog back out. <laughs> it's, it don't work on country music. Oh, but, you know, you play Led Zeppelin backwards, ACDC backwards. It's gonna, you're going to hear these demonic messages. Man, we found a way to do that. You know what we heard? Unless you can speak Portuguese or something, you know, I, I, I didn't. Here, they're hearing anything, saying anything about Satan. See, this is the way that God moves. God authenticates his word by putting things in there that can, God, what is it? God's privilege is to what? Hide things. But it is our privilege to what? Discover things. So, with all that, man, I, I, I took you there because I got to go somewhere. So, we see all this encryption also found following some bad parenting in the word of God. Because there's some very bad parents right off the beginning. Throughout Genesis, we watch the patriarchs, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Man, these guys, uh, uh, they're, they're, they're wonderful men. However, they make a mess of things. They are not perfect men. They are not the most godly men. And we see throughout their lives, you see lying and selfishness and anger and deception, manipulation, favoritism. You see all this stuff. And have you know, as the fathers go... The sons go. The daughters go. You know, that, that whole apple doesn't fall far from the trees is truth. And so you see sinful habits passed down from the patriarchs to their children. Now, we wrap up. We're looking at Genesis 38. We wrap up Genesis chapter 37 where we're introduced to Joseph, who was the last of the patriarchs, and he's been shanghaied by his brothers. He's been thrown into a pit and then sold off into slavery, uh, and the whole point of that was because of his father's failure. His father showed favoritism towards his son, and then his son seemed to have a little bit of assumed arrogance in the way he was acting, <clears throat> talking about, oh, y'all going to bow down to me. Well, that didn't set right, right with his brothers. So instead of acting right, what do they do? They acted bad. And so you come up to this where you got bad parenting and passed on to kids who are acting bad. But then you skip over to chapter 39, and what you find is um, you, it picks up with a newly humbled Joseph, a humbled man. And not only does he become humbled, but his brothers become humbled. His daddy becomes humble, and suddenly all of Israel, where they've been bad and, and, and acting up, acting the fool, a lot of it, all the way up to 37 from 39 on, they change. Yeah. Mm -hmm. There's something that happens in chapter number 38, and I'm going to tell you it's very pivotal, it's very destiny changing, and it is absolutely weird. It is one of the strangest things. Uh, Eddie and Lori Smith are our recovery pastors. We were talking about this yesterday, and I'm about to dive into this. Have you prayed for me? All right, keep praying for me, because I'm telling you, some of y'all, y'all read the Bible and think, oh, this just gives me such peace. I just love reading the Word of God. It gives me such peace and joy and hope. You ain't reading the same Bible I'm reading. Because <laughs> sometimes those, the Bible I read says some very strange stuff. And it don't get no strength. That's good English, by the way, in Arkansas. It don't get no weirder than Genesis chapter 38. So, are you ready? All right, you hurry up. I want lunch. Okay, you're with me. Stay with me. Here we go. 
The sons of Jacob, we want to look at them. There are 12 sons of Jacob, the, the last of the big three. You got Reuben all the way down to Benjamin. Now, Reuben, who was the oldest, had had sexual relationship with his, wife, with his father's concubine, one of kind of a stepwife. And uh, because he had had uh, uh, an affair with this woman, uh, he was on the outs with his dad. He was on the outs with his heavenly father. So he's kind of shoved back. Well, the next two brothers, you've got Simeon and Levi, both of them uh, got in some hot water because they lost their tempers and they murdered a bunch of innocent people after one of their, after their sister got raped. And you know, well, it was a bad thing. Yes, yeah, stand up for your sister. What you did though, guys, was wrong. It was murder what you did. And so they're on the outs. Well, that leaves the next son, Judah, who kind of by, uh, he becomes the spiritual head of the family by way of attrition. I mean, you got the first three out. I'm next. Oh, boy. I, I hope I do this right. So Judah steps up. So let's see what he does. Judah has a son by the name of Ur. And uh, uh, he decides to get a wife for his son, so he finds a girl by the name of Tamar. And he gets them married, and, and they're all going off into the sunset. The only problem is, is Ur is a bad guy. And God does not like how Ur turned out. And so the Bible says that God killed Ur. Well, now you got another situation because Ur died without getting his wife pregnant. She has no children to take care of her. And one of the lowest of the low of all society is the widow. That literally the widow would starve to death if she had nobody to take care of her. It was the children's job to take care of the parents after the parents couldn't take care of themselves. Sounds like it ought to be today. That was pretty weak. Okay. I encourage my kids to get good jobs because they got to take care of us. Now, he doesn't have any, she doesn't have any children. So there's a thing by it that's tradition, it's oral tradition at that time. Moses would actually codify it. He would make it a law in Deuteronomy 25. It's a thing called Leverite marriage. Now, Leverite marriage has nothing to do with Levi, the tribe of Levi. Leverite marriage, when you translate that in uh, Leverite into uh, Latin, it actually means uh, husband's brother. Uh, and so the brother is supposed to marry uh, his sister-in-law and produce for her children. Now, he could, um, uh, that, those children would be provided for. Now, this was not a popular thing, and here's why. Uh, the man could go on and marry other women. He could find a wife of his own choosing. So he has a sister-in-law. He's doing his duty for her, but he also marries the love of his life, and he has children with her. The problem is, is that if you marry your brother's wife first, and you have no other children, well, that child not only becomes the heir of your brother's estate, that child, who is your son, will also inherit your estate. And so the children, by the wife of, of your choosing, loses out to the children of the wife that you kind of had to adopt and take care of. So your family loses out to your brother's family. So that's why it wasn't a popular thing. Your kids are going to suffer at your dead brother's expense. That's the way it was. You can go and look at the book of Ruth. Have you seen where Ruth comes back with her mother-in-law and uh, somebody said, hey, uh, uh, who's going to marry this girl? Boaz decides to stir things up because he likes her. I think she's pretty. She was young. He said, man, I like this. and She's a good woman. I think I'm going to marry her. But I'm not in the line. There was a kinsman redeemer that had to be had. It's the same sort of thing. And, oh, yeah, man, she's pretty. I think I'll marry her. Well, uh, if you marry her, then you have to, like, give ownership and to her and her children, the children you pretty. Well, okay, wait a minute. I don't want to take from my children and give to her. I don't want to do that. So you see, this could be a negative, sort of a negative thing. Therefore, Onan, who was the second born of uh, Judah, Onan says, man, I don't want to get her pregnant. Let's see what the word of God says. In the course of time, Judah arranged for his firstborn son, Ur, to marry a young woman named Tamar. But Ur was a wicked man in the Lord's sight. 
the Lord took his life. Then Judah said to Ur's brother, Onan, go and marry Tamar as our law requires of the brother of a man who has died. You must produce an heir for your brother. But Onan was not willing to have a child who would not be his own heir. So whenever he had intercourse with his brother's wife, he spilled the semen on the ground. This prevented her from having a child who would belong to his brother. But the Lord considered it evil for Onan to deny a child to his dead brother. So the Lord took Onan's life too. Then Judah said to Tamar, his daughter-in-law, go back to your parents' home and remain a widow until my, my youngest son, Sheila, is old enough to marry you. But Judah didn't really intend. He did not intend to allow uh, this because he was afraid Sheila would die also like his two brothers. So Tamar went back to live in her father's home. Pretty twisted series of events. Uh, it gets better. Hallelujah. I mean, this is going to look like Jerry Springer before we're all said and done. <laughs> Years later, Judah's wife dies. He has not provided. Sheila's come to age. He has not allowed Sheila to become the husband of Tamar. He's kind of held her back, held him back. He, he ain't going to have nothing to do with this. Uh, instead of, he doesn't realize, instead of, God killed your sons because they were wicked. God killed your sons because they acted like you. Yeah. Somebody's seen that. And he doesn't want to lose his third son. And so he holds off. Well, Judah's wife dies. And uh, uh, so he decides, he gets invited to go to a local town by the name of Timnah. And at Timnah, they're doing a sheep shearing. So the Bible says he's going to go over there and oversee this sheep shearing. So as he's overseeing it, he goes down there. And, uh, and sheep shearing is a big event. There's a, as you're doing a lot of work, there's also a lot of parting that goes on, kind of like the end of the harvest kind of thing. We're all going to celebrate because God's provided. Well, Tamar has an agenda. She hears that her father-in-law is going down there. And so it says that she got certain clothes and dressed herself up as a prostitute. Now, I found this, I found this picture here. Uh, that's, that's Tamar dressed as a prostitute. And, of course, the man up front, that would be Judah. And I'm looking at her thinking, man, that don't look like no prostitute to me. That looks like Mary, you know, the mother of Jesus. That's, that's, that that ain't dressed like pretty woman or anything like that. So I thought, well they know what they were doing. Well, she dressed up like a prostitute and uh, she seduces her father-in-law and uh, says, hey, big boy, come with me. They go have a good time. And the thing that's craziest to me, when, how many you know you read the Bible, it goes in one eye and out the other. You don't pay attention to what you're reading. Here he had a sexual relationship with this woman, never realizing that was his daughter-in-law. How on earth do you do that? I have no idea. Craziness. After it's all said and done, she says, how are you going to pay me? He says, I'll send you a goat. And uh, well, how do I know you're going to send me a goat, you old goat? You're going to leave me some collateral. And so he says, all right, here's my signet ring. And you got to understand this is a valuable piece of furniture to a man because this is how you sign all your legal documents. This right here is your identification. You do not want to get that hijacked. And he also leaves with her his staff. He's part of a, of a nomadic tribe. The staff of a, of a shepherd looks more like a notepad. All the significant events of his life have been etched on this staff. It's an important piece of property to him as well. So he leaves these two pieces of property to her, says, hold on to these. I'll go back over there, send you a goat, send that back with a servant. All right, he leaves, but she leaves too. And she takes the stuff with her. And so Judah decides, he says, hey, man, Take a goat over there, find the, find the prostitute in purple that looks like Mary, the mother of Jesus. Go, go find her and, and take her the stuff. Man, he looks everywhere and comes back. I looked everywhere. I could not find that prostitute. Do you want me to take a bunch of guys and do a manhunt? No, I don't want you to do that. That's embarrassing. I shouldn't have been with a prostitute in the first place. Hello, somebody. Okay, I expect a better amen than that. And he, he's going to be embarrassed because he's lost some of his most prized possessions. Don't worry about it. We'll just go home and act like nothing ever happened. Well, they go home. As it turns out, a little while later, he finds out Tamar's pregnant. Oh, that brazen hussy. She done got pregnant, and she wasn't waiting on my son. Well, you never were going to give her your son in the first place. Bad parenting. So he decides, I'm gonna, I am going to save the family name. How am I going to do it? I'm going to kill her. Yeah, that saves the family name. I don't get that. I'm going to kill her, and that's going to save the family name. I'm going to burn her at the stake. And so he issues the order, and uh, uh, here's where we pick up 
from the word of God. But as they were taking her out to kill her, she sent this message to her father-in-law. The man who owns these things made me pregnant. Look closely. Whose seal and cord and walking stick are these? Mm, tell me some man wasn't eating some crow at that moment. Terrible. Now, here's what I want you to see. All the way up to this point, it's bad parenting, bad kids who become bad parents, who raise bad kids. It's a, it's a fiendish cycle. Now, I want you to see how Judah reacts. Judah recognized them immediately and said, she is more righteous than I am because I didn't arrange for her to marry my son, Sheila. And Judah never slept with Tamar again. When the time came for Tamar to give birth, it was discovered that she was carrying twins. Now, the significance of this is this, that at this moment, not only does Judah realize his sin, but he owns up to it. And where there was supposed to be a Goel, a kinsman redeemer, the, the Leverite that would come in and, and, and the brother that would marry the sister-in-law, he becomes the redeemer himself. Because he got her pregnant, guess where she had to come live? He now became literally the husband of his daughter-in-law. But what does it say? He never slept with her again. Why? He learned his lesson. He would take care of her, he would provide for her, but he would never have anything in that nature to happen again because what does the word of God say? You're not supposed to be behaving like that. What we see is a character transformation that occurs in Judah. Something happens, something shifts in Judah at that moment. And I believe this is where things change for the nation of Israel. Um, we find out that he has two sons. They are Perez, or some translations calls him Ferez, like with a PH, and another brother called Zira. Now, Perez actually becomes, and I believe this is because of grace, this is because of repentance. He actually becomes the 10th generation grandfather to King David himself, as well as the, the, the forefather of Jesus Christ himself. Why? Man, that's a bunch of scallywag hooliganism going on there. That's southern. Some of y'all should have got what I just said. It's because of grace. Go back and reread the entire lineage of Jesus Christ, and you're going to find bad person after bad person. You're going to find that Rahab the harlot back in, back in uh, uh, the time of the wandering around when they were trying to get into the Holy Land there at Jericho. Rahab the harlot winds up in the lineage of Jesus Christ. Ruth, man, Ruth ain't even a Jew. Ruth is of a, a Moab, a whole other group. Matter of fact, a group that would be a, a, a thorn in the side of Israel. They would be the enemy on the battlefield of Israel. And what does God do? He takes an enemy woman and engrafts her in the lineage of Jesus Christ. See, God has a habit of taking our failures and our messes and making something good out of it. How do you know if you take that, that off-ramp out of God's will, no matter how long you stay out of God's will, there's always an on-ramp right back into it. And God has a habit of working, what does the Bible say? All things for our good. He works out all things for our good if we love him and serve him. And this is a picture to me how God used, how God used this literally an illegitimate son. Man, a thing that should never have happened. And God says, that's okay. I'll make something out of it. I'll make something out of it. Uh, so, I mean, all you got to do is look at Solomon. Solomon was the son of, a, of, a, a, of an affair that turned into a marriage. I mean, just go back and look at all that craziness. What I find even more interesting, I remember we talked about the equidistant letter sequencing. Okay, here's where your inner nerd needs to kick in. If you take Genesis 38 and run it, they make computer programs now. You can actually buy it online. You can buy this program and type in all, whatever you're looking for. And you will find this is what has been found. Uh, and this is proven, listen, proven, documented, you could do it yourself. 
what they find is when you do it by every 49th letter, you're going to come across the names of Boaz, you're going to come across the name of Ruth, of Obed, Jesse, and David, all five of them in Genesis 38, a long time before they're ever born. And yet their names in chronological order are found embedded, friend, into this system of Genesis 38. God was foretelling in advance where this was going to lead. As a matter of fact, not only is this so incredible, here's something you miss. Is that when Israel starts complaining to Samuel saying, give us a king, make us a kingdom. We don't like what you're doing. They're rebelling against God. They're rebelling against Samuel. And what does God say? Give him a king. Who does he pick out? He picks out Saul. He doesn't pick out David. Why? Because that's a man after their heart. But God recognizes this. Let me give you a bad king. Because I've already destined for you to have a king. See, God already had this prepared. But men got out of the way because of wrong timing. If they had let God do it, guess what would have happened? David would have arrived on the scene and been the king they always needed. And we find all of this incredible future, the, the uh, incredible future of Boaz, Ruth, all of this where? In the very story of a place where things just absolutely fell apart absolutely fell apart because see that's the goodness of our God that's what our God does and when fathers determine to do things right listen to me dads listen to me moms when as parents we determine to do things right things are going to turn up blessed when we do it God's way it's going to work out no matter what you think at the moment God's way is always the best way and that rule still applies today. I'm not going to go in deep to it, but here's some homework for you. Look up, look up the legacies of the two fathers. Uh, you got Jonathan Edwards, who was a minister back in the 18th century. Here's a guy who preached the sermon many of you studied in, in world history, in, in uh, English history. It was uh, the man who preached the sermon, Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God. I remember that. This, I mean, that's a hellfire brimstone sermon. He was not a hellfire brimstone guy. He was not a shouter and a spitter. Yeah, he preached this message. And I'll tell you, out of his own life, this is what's crazy. When you study his life, you're going to find out that uh, uh, he had one vice president that was, that was his offspring, three senators, three governors. three. This is back when politicians were good people. That came out. I'm sorry. 13 college presidents, 30 judges, 65 professors, 80 public office holders, 100 lawyers, and 100 missionaries. Good men came out from a good man. But you find a study that came out later by a guy by the name of Max Jukes. Jukes is actually a pseudonym. That's not his last name. They actually started to study on this man because there in the 19th century, find out this man, they could trace 40-something, 40 42, 49 different criminals, actually trace their lineage back to this one man. And so they decided to do a family tree kind of thing. They didn't have Ancestry.com, but they looked it up, and here's what they found off of this man right here. They found that in his lineage, off of his descendants below him, were seven murderers, 60 thieves, 50 prostitutes, 13, uh, excuse me, 130 other convicts, 310 who were absolutely the poorest of the poor, uh, uh, 400 who were physically racked by alcoholism and drug addiction. It's estimated that back in the 19th century, his offspring cost the state of New York one and a quarter million dollars of taxpayers' money to deal with them. How do you know the law of blessing because of good parenting still applies today? It's not just something from the Old Testament. It's today. So I preach all of that to get to my real sermon, and that's this. Dad, Mom, raise your children right. Raise your children right. God does not require of your parenting perfection. I will tell you this right now. You will never be a perfect parent. Ever. Ask your kids. They'll tell you you're not a perfect parent. Don't ask your kid right now. It'll, it'll, it'll hurt your feelings. You'll never be a perfect parent. 
but you can be a righteous parent. You can be a godly parent. Doesn't mean we're always going to do things wrong or right. We may make some wrong decisions. But I would rather be aiming at doing it right and get it right than never aiming to get it right and always doing it wrong. Here's my concept of it. I want to be the kind of parent so that they'll be that same kind of parent for my grandchildren. I don't want to live like the devil and then expect my children to raise my grandchildren as angels because it's not going to happen. Pastor Mike, I've already raised my kids and I've made my mistakes. Own up to it. Remember what we saw in Scripture. Man, Israel was bad. All of Israel was bad all the way up through chapter 37. But you see, following 38, starting in 39, there is a change in the attitude. And it's not that Judah went around starting to say, hey, I made all these mistakes. Hey, all y'all need to correct. We don't, that's not in the Word of God. But there was a spiritual shift when one brother said, I'm going to do this different. Are you hearing me? There's a spiritual shift in Scripture when one brother says, I'm going to do this right. I've messed up to this point. I've messed up to this point. And two of my sons are already dead because of my bad example. But I still got one. And not just this one. Now I got two more. From this day on, I'm going to do it right. You see, that's the goodness of God. God's not asking you to try to go back and fix everything you've done. He says, start from this day on and do it right. I will take care of everything else behind you and in front of you. Come on, somebody. That ought to be good news to you. But that only happens if I belong to him. There's a saying that says the greatest thing I could ever do for my children as a father is to love their mother. I agree with that. But I will tell you even beyond loving the child's mother is love the child's God. If you'll be the son of God that you need to be, you'll be, men, the husband that your wife needs you to be. You'll be, woman, the wife that your husband's needing. You'll be the parent that your kids need. You'll be the citizen that our country requires. But it all stems to that one point. Am I willing to say, God, I've blown it. I've messed up. I made a mess of things. Help me, Lord. Help me to make this right. And I give you my life, whatever it is, little or much, I give you my life from this day onward. I want you to bow your heads with me right now. I know time's getting away, but friend, I'm telling you, this is the most important decision you could ever make. I don't know what your life has been like. I look at this poor lady we fished out of the riverbank yesterday. Her life right now is already hell. What got her there, who knows? But if she stays a crackhead, if she stays addicted to drugs, if she stays, she's going to know hell firsthand. I don't want that to happen to anybody on my watch. How are you today? First of all, do you know Jesus Christ as your Savior? Do you know him as your Savior? Doesn't matter if you're a dad or a mom. This is for everybody. Being a Christian does not make you perfect. It will not make you sinless, but it will cause you to sin less. If you're trying to please your Heavenly Father. If that's you today, God's ready for you to come home and make things right. You may be here this morning 
And you would say, Pastor Mike, I'm doing my best to love God, but man, I've made so many mistakes. I've done some very tragic things in my life, and I don't know how to fix it. There's good news for you today. God will take care of that. If God could shift Israel after an encounter with Judah, God can shift the remainder of your life and whatever a mess you made of it, if you'll come to him. So with heads bowed, eyes closed, I'm ask my prayer team, come up here right now, my altar workers, step out right now from where you're at. All my staff, I want you to step out where you're at and come down here. Come down to the front and face the front. We have prayer teams right now that are ready to pray with you for whatever it is to give your heart to the Lord, to give your past to the Lord. Whatever it is, God is ready to make a difference. So as they sing this song, I want you to step out and Father, I pray, give courage and boldness to step out. Give the wisdom to recognize if I don't step out, I can guarantee nothing's going to happen. But if I do step out, there is that good chance my good, good Father is going to change my life. Come on. Come on. Come on. Sing this song. Come on, is there somebody else? You need, you need to lay some things before God. Come on. You do not know Jesus Christ is your Savior. Come right now. Come right now. There is no better time and there's no judgmental person going to criticize you. to accept Jesus Christ as your Savior, come on down. You made some mistakes in your life that seem to haunt you. They seem to haunt you. Come on, step out right now. Step out right now. Don't sit there and wait. Let somebody pray with you and agree with you. The Bible says where two are gathered and they pray over a thing, the Bible says it's done. Come on, you want to see a change in your life? You want to see a change from the things of your past? You want to see a change right now? Maybe you're facing some issues in your life that's sending you down a dark road. Your life can be changed right now. Come on, step out. Step out right now in Jesus' name. And let God make a difference. Let God make a difference. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Hallelujah.
again. Come on, he's a perfect God. And how you treat us and how you provide for us, how you watch over us. Yes. pastor is the product of a mother and father that were religious but not godly my father was a Sunday school teacher for several years before he eventually realized he was not even saved and gave his heart to Jesus Christ my parents who I could easily say I learned some very bad habits from eventually got their stuff straight when I was the age of about 12 and they began to live for God I rebelled for a season because I saw what my parents used to be and that's what I wanted but I had a good good father a heavenly father that said, no, son, I want you to be like your daddy is now. And I am saved today because of a good, good heavenly father that reached out to my mom and dad and then reached down to me and is doing his best to reach down to my children for how they'll live. I'll tell you, friend, it's never too late it's never too late well these are praying I want them to keep praying the rest of you can just stand with me as you will I do want to say God bless you and thank you for being with us at church today we're not going to have service tonight so spend time with your your family I'm going to make my kids spend time with their father <laughs> Of course, it's mama's birthday today too, so I'm gonna make them spend time with their mama first. <laughs> cause, I'm a, Cause I'm a wise father. We do have for all of you that are dads, uh, we have a gift for you out there, a uh, $10 gift card. We're not gonna buy you a keychain or a tie. We're gonna give you something you can use. And uh, uh, we want you to know you're appreciated every time you eat that hamburger or drink that soda. Know that your church loves you. Go with God. God bless you. We love you. May the hand of God and peace of God keep you every step of the way. God bless you. Have a wonderful afternoon, wonderful rest of your day, and go get them Monday morning. God bless you. We love you. We'll see you all uh, this week. Don't forget Wednesday. We're not having church Wednesday because we're having to redo the floors. We'll see y'all next Sunday. God bless you.